I have a pig heart, the reason that I choose pig heart is because genetically pig has many similarities to human. And as you know, the valves of a pig heart still is used for some of our patients. First thing that I notice is this strong back that is around the heart. That's fibrous pericardium. This is a dense, irregular connective tissue that rest on the diaphragm and actually it's attached to the diaphragm. It protects the heart. At the same time, it basically does not allow the heart to overstretch and anchors the heart in the mediastinum region. Recall mediastinum region refers to the space that we have in the thoracic cavity between the two pleural cavities. Even with the fibrous pericardium, I can locate the apex of the heart and I know base would be up here. One thing that I need to mention here is that fibrous pericardium is not the only pericardium that we have around the heart. Here, a little bit, I open the fibrous pericardium. As you can see, it's very strong because it's full of bundles of collagen fibers in all different directions. So you see that its uh, strength is very clear. The moment that I go in the inner wall of fibrous pericardium, we should acknowledge that here we have one of the two serous membranes attached to the inside of fibrous pericardium. That would be parietal serous membrane. And the other serous membrane is visceral serous membrane, which is attached to the actual heart. Recall that visceral serous pericardium is also referred to as epicardium. That would be one of the layers that form the wall of the heart. So in general, I can say that I have three pericardium layers. I have fibrous pericardium attached to the inside of fibrous pericardium. We have parietal serous membrane and then attached to the actual heart, we have visceral serous membrane. Between visceral membrane and parietal membrane, we have a thin film of serous fluid, which lubricates the area and obviously allows the heart to move easily without having friction. Before I remove the fibrous pericardium and parietal serous membrane to show you the actual heart, I would like you to pay attention that, first of all, fibrous pericardium is attached to the connective tissues that cover the blood vessels, the blood vessels that either enter the heart or exit the heart. And when I look at the blood vessels, I notice some of them, their lumen is wide open because they do have a thick wall. So even though no blood is flowing through these blood vessels, they stay open. These are arteries and they need to have thick wall to handle the pressure because arteries in general are under more pressure compared to the veins. But when I see some blood vessels, for example, here, I can see a blood vessel that has a very thin wall. It's collapsed completely. That's a vein. As you see, I have to open the vein using my instrument. So thin wall in vein, thick wall in artery. And as you see, the arteries, because of their thick wall, stay open. So now what I do, I remove the fibrous pericardium, and I'm sure you notice that we have adipose tissue in many different places. Clearly, the adipose tissue would be for protection. It's a great cushion that we need to have around an important visceral organ such as heart. This is the anterior view of the pig heart. That would be the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. And recall between the two ventricles on the anterior, we do have a sulcus that is called anterior interventricular sulcus. In this sulcus, we can find adipose tissue. Also, we can find some important arteries such as anterior interventricular artery. Right now, obviously, blood clot has formed inside these blood vessels, so they have a darker color. The other name for anterior interventricular artery, the name that in real practice we use it more often, is left anterior descending artery, LAD. That's the one that supplies both ventricles anteriorly. And we know that it's a branch of the left coronary artery. Also in anterior interventricular sulcus, we can find a vein such as great cardiac vein. So that would be a vein that drains the oxygenated blood from the wall of the heart and eventually empty it into the coronary sinus. Now, speaking of coronary sinus, as soon as I look at the sulcus, 
So I'm opening the sulcus here between atrium and ventricle. That would be the coronary sulcus. And we know that coronary sulcus goes all around. We find it between atria and ventricles. Now deep inside the coronary sulcus, if I go deep in, I can locate the coronary sinus, that vein that we see here, deep inside the coronary sulcus on the posterior is the coronary sinus. This is the one that drains the oxygenated blood from most of the veins that we have in the wall of the heart. And we know that coronary sinus empties the deoxygenated blood that it collects from the wall of the heart into the right atrium. Now I keep going through the coronary sulcus. As you can see, it goes around and eventually I get between right atrium and right ventricle. So one more time in anterior view, I can see the two atria, right versus left, and the two ventricles, right versus left. And here we have a beautiful view of the pulmonary trunk. That's the artery that right ventricle pumps deoxygenated blood into. And we know that the pulmonary trunk is going to divide into two pulmonary arteries. Those are the ones that send the oxygenated blood to the lungs. And inside the lungs, we know that blood becomes oxygenated. I take a look at the posterior because we know that we have three sulci. So we found the coronary sulcus. We found the anterior interventricular sulcus. And now here we have posterior interventricular sulcus. In posterior interventricular sulcus, we do have an artery such as posterior, or we can say inferior interventricular artery. That's the one that supplies the ventricles on the posterior side with oxygenated blood. Also here we find a vein such as middle cardiac vein. That's the vein that collects the oxygenated blood from the wall of ventricles on the posterior side and eventually send this blood into the coronary sinus, which as I mentioned, coronary sinus is deep in coronary sulcus on the posterior side. Quickly, back to what I said about veins versus arteries, that's a very small section of inferior vena cava. When I place my instrument, my instrument eventually gets inside the right atrium, as you can see. And if I'm looking for superior vena cava, I have to look for a collapsed blood vessel. So here I can see a collapsed blood vessel. And when I insert my instrument, eventually my instruments get out, as you see, through inferior vena cava. So the middle of my instrument is inside the right atrium. So that's how we locate superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. And we know these two send deoxygenated blood from upper part and from lower part of our body to the right atrium. And also coronary sinus empty deoxygenated blood that it receives from the wall of the heart into the right atrium. So those are the three veins that send deoxygenated blood into the right atrium. And now I take a look at the pulmonary trunk. One easy way to find it is in the anterior view. And the other artery that I see here, the one that is wide open, that would be aorta. That's basically part of the aorta. When I dissect the heart, which would be through frontal section, when I place my instrument inside the aorta, you see that the rest of my instrument is inside the left ventricle because we know left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood into aorta. And we know that right ventricle pumps deoxygenated blood into pulmonary trunk. Before I start dissecting the heart, I would like you to pay attention to the presence of auricles, these pouches, these tiny sacs or balloons that we have in the anterior of both atria. So I see the auricles in the anterior of the left atrium and also, if I look at the right atrium, I can see the auricles here. Think about them as some extra spaces that we need to have in atria. So this was a very short summary of the external anatomy of the heart. The next thing that I do, I start dissecting the heart through coronal plane or frontal plane.
what I do, I start from one of the atria, for example, right atrium. I go all the way down toward the apex. I cut the atrial wall and also ventricular wall. When I get to the apex, then I continue cutting ventricular wall and also atrial wall. And to completely open the heart, I need to also cut the inter ventricular septum. Here we have a coronal or frontal section of the heart. Quickly, I identify right atrium versus left atrium, left ventricle versus right ventricle. The reason I know this is left because we know left ventricle between these four chambers has the thickest wall. So pay attention to the thickness of the wall in left ventricle versus right ventricle. And in the wall of the heart, we identify three layers. The outer layer is the epicardium. Epicardium, recall, part of it is the visceral serous membrane. The inner layer is endocardium. Endocardium is a very smooth layer. And that's actually one of its main functions to create a smooth surface and reduce friction between blood and the wall of the heart. If the friction between blood and the wall of the heart, or later when we talk about blood vessels, the friction between blood and the wall of blood vessel is more than what it's supposed to be, there is always a possibility of a coagulation process to start. For example, platelet become damaged and then their content will be released out and that would lead to the formation of platelet plug and an unwanted wanted blood clot. So that's one of the important things about endocardium to reduce friction and create a smooth surface. Between endocardium and epicardium, we have cardiac muscles. So as you see, most of the wall of the heart is made of cardiac muscles, and we name this layer myocardium. So now I can say that left ventricle has the thickest myocardium between all these four chambers. Then I pay attention that still I can see the coronary sulcus between atria and ventricles. Between atria and ventricles, I should locate the atrioventricular valves. I start with the left atrioventricular valve. That would be the left atrioventricular valve, or we can call it bicuspid valve or mitral valve. So it's located between left atrium and left ventricle. And as you see, there are some tendon-like structures, very strong, the ones that right now I'm pulling, named cordy tendony. What they do, they attach the cusps of bicuspid valve to some long muscles that we have in the wall of the ventricle. We name these muscles papillary muscles. And recall when ventricles start contracting, they push blood up. That's the moment that atrioventricular valves must close. But we know ventricles are very strong. There is a possibility that when they keep pushing blood up, the cusp of AV valves basically flap and open backward. That is dangerous. We don't want blood from ventricle go back into the atrium. So that's the moment that since the wall of ventricle contract, papillary muscles of ventricles also contract. And when they contract, they pull the cordy tendony, as you see, cordy tendony become really tight, and they are pulling down the cusps of AV valves. Basically, this is very important, physiologically speaking, to keep the AV valve closed the entire time that ventricle is pushing blood up. And we know that when ventricles keep pushing after closing the AV valves, the goal is to increase the pressure inside the ventricle and exceed the pressure inside the artery. Since I'm talking about left ventricle, obviously that artery is aorta. And exactly at the beginning of aorta, I see aortic semilunar valve. So I'm pointing at the cusps of aortic semilunar valve when pressure inside the left ventricle exceed the pressure in artery, which at rest, um, just the pressure inside the left ventricle should exceed 80 millimeter of mercury aortic semilunar valve opens, and then left ventricle keep contracting its wall and pushing blood, pumping blood into the aorta. So that would be the ascending aorta. And at rest, we see that the pressure inside aorta goes up to maximum 120 millimeter of mercury. During the entire time, aortic semilunar valve stays open, but bicuspid valve stays closed. And it stays closed, especially because of the tightening of the cordy tendony. As soon as ventricle relaxes, 
that's the moment blood inside aorta start backflowing and that's exactly the moment that aortic semilunar valve must close. Please keep in mind everything that I explain in the left side simultaneously is happening in the right side. So when I go to the right side, first thing that I do, I find the tricuspid valve. So right now I am pulling one of the cusps of tricuspid valve, or we can say right atrioventricular valve. I see that tricuspid valve is attached by cord tendony to the papillary muscles that we have inside the right ventricle. So here I'm pulling down the cord tendony. And uh, we know that from right ventricle, we're going to pump blood into pulmonary trunk. So that would be the pulmonary trunk. From here, I have to go there. At the beginning of pulmonary trunk, we find pulmonary semilunar valve. However, when we have just one coronal section, because the two semilunar valves are not at the same plane, we find only one of them. But we know that at the beginning of pulmonary trunk, we also have a semilunar valve named pulmonary valve. And please pay attention how open aorta is compared to pulmonary trunk. The reason is aorta, even at rest, experiences pressures that left ventricle generates from 80 to 120 millimeter of mercury, but pulmonary trunk experiences much lower pressures. The pressures that at rest pulmonary trunk experiences would be 20 to maximum 30 millimeter of mercury. So pulmonary trunk does not need to have a thick wall as aorta does, and that's the reason that when blood is not flowing through them, pulmonary trunk tend to a little bit collapse. So if I go back to the external view, you can see that pulmonary trunk is slightly collapsed, but aorta is just wide open. The next thing I pay attention to the presence of the branches of coronary artery. So those little things that you see here are branches of coronary artery. For example, I know exactly in the left side between left atrium and left ventricle, I must find a branch that is called circumflex branch. That's the one that supplies uh, the left side of the heart with oxygenated blood. If I go to the external view close to the right ventricle, I can see a shadow of the marginal artery. That's the artery that supplies the right ventricle. Inside the ventricles, we name all these muscle ridges that we have. Doesn't matter, short or tall. We name all of them trabeculi carni. Obviously, we name the ones that are much taller than the rest, and more importantly, they're connected to the cusps of AV valves by cord tendony, papillary muscles. But I also notice that in the wall of both atria, I have muscle ridges. We name the muscle ridges that we have in the wall of atria pectinate muscles. So it is important to acknowledge that also in the wall of atria, we have muscles, and we know that the Pectinate muscles contract, or we can say in general, atrial walls contract during atrial systole. This is interventricular septum. Just look at the thickness of the interventricular septum. It separates the two ventricles from one another. Next, I walk you through the three veins that send the oxygenated blood into the right atrium. I talked about superior vena cava. I talked about inferior vena cava and also the coronary sinus, which we can find it deep inside the coronary sulcus. Speaking of the left atrium, we know that we have four pulmonary veins. What they do, they bring oxygenated blood from lungs into left atrium. So here I can see the openings of the pulmonary veins. The ones that I'm pointing at are the left pulmonary veins and here I find the openings of the right pulmonary veins. But unfortunately, they cut the pulmonary veins very short, so we cannot actually see them. We just see the opening of the veins. And uh, if I investigate a little bit more, I should find the opening of the coronary sinus also inside the right atrium. And uh, from right atrium, I can easily use my instrument and get inside superior vena cava, as you see. And if I go down, I find the 
opening of inferior vena cava. So if I go back, you can see that I actually get inside the inferior vena cava. That's the proof that all these veins are open inside the atria. And recall that at the opening of the veins into the atria, we do not have any valve. So we can say that these veins are open into the atria all the time. That simply means that during the cardiac cycle, atria receive blood through these veins all the time. And as soon as the pressure inside the atria exceeds the pressure inside the ventricles, that's the moment that AV valves open. But please note that AV valves close as soon as ventricles start contracting and pushing blood up. So the opening of the valves is always due to the pressure gradient, and the closing of the valves should be for the goal of preventing backflow of blood. I hope that you find this information helpful.